Come here, Big Z. Uh, Come here. Come here. Come here. Come here, Big Z. Come on, Big Here you go. You gotta be the star again. Come on, get up here. There you go. Sit right down next to me. There you go. Sit next to Daddy. That's good. Cool. Perfect. Is what in the hail? No, oh, it's unplugged. Huh? I unplugged it. Yeah. Uh... Here we go. All right. Uh, <laughs> that was ridiculous. That was fun. And that was, that was exactly as. Uh, as ridiculous and uh, uh, adventurous as I w as what I would expect after seeing you play so so many times. Well, it's funny because the bass on the original track is. I mean, I'm just kind of playing a more and crazy version of it, but it's like. I mean, I, I was I didn't play any differently on that track than I would with like Critters or the Dead Kenny G's or even the Bohemians if we had some. I mean, it was just like. Britney Spears, whatever you know, that's right. a pretty killer track. Oh, yeah, it's a it's a it's a pretty sick bass line. Yeah, I, I like that. Yeah. I, I dig. I like her vocals on there. It's cool. Um, so I I was telling you earlier, I probably saw you play 25, 30 times. Right. Um, and that was that left a, a big enough impact on me as a young person who had just gotten to Seattle. I'd only been there within a, a couple years, like seeing the types of musicians that you guys were. I never, you know, I never encountered anyone like that. So here's a little backstory that maybe you don't know. <laughs> and um, uh, it's, it's hilarious and amazing. And it, um, so you play an integral part to my whole story. And here's why. I got to Seattle, I had a Jackson Shredder metal guitar. Yeah. <laughs> and a, a shaved head, and white Doc Martens, and uh, Ooh, I, would, white I would show up to to ads that I had you know replied to in the Rocket, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, the myth goes you know it happened a number of times. It happened once. I showed up and someone answered the door and was like no and just shut the door, and I was like that's awesome. It's no. totally awesome. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's pretty amazing. But I tried and tried and tried and, and you know really I wanted to be in like a I wanted to be in like helmet or something. You know, oh yeah, everybody helmet. wanted to be helmet for a while for sure. Um, yeah. Why well, count me in that crowd? And so, but uh, but I finally met some guys that needed a bass player. And I uh, I was like, oh well, you know, I I, I play guitar. I'm trying I'm trying to find a band. And they said, well, we need a bass player. I was like, I I'm a bass player too. I never played the bass. I never Ooh. was even interested in playing the bass because. Uh, the music that I had listened to growing up, all the bass, other than like Zeppelin and you know the Who, right. the bass just went do do do. Yeah, I didn't want to do like that. I wanted to shadow of the guitar. I yeah. wanted to shred, you know. Um, but curiously, as a as a as a metal kid, I heard you play fretless bass on what I am. It was one of the first bass lines that ever stood out. Oh man! To me, uh -huh. and I was like, oh the. That's that's the bass, right? Right. That's the bass doing this incredible thing, and then and I, I heard that you guys lived in town, and I tracked you down. Well, I ended up giving you like one or two bass lessons. Yeah. Yeah, you came over to me and Chamberlain's place where we were staying. I learned a valuable lesson uh, in all that as well. Being. Well, uh, I just realized that. My idea of what happens when you have a, a successful oh yeah, so we had a hit record, and I'm in this ratty like five hundred dollar two bedroom apartment. And me and Chamberlain were above sharing. a bodega. Yeah, above a bodega in Seattle. It was just super tiny, low rent in Ballard before Ballard blew up, and it was yeah, we were just slumming it, man. Neither one of us had any money, and uh, yeah, it was hilarious. And so that's. <laughs> I realized I, I had chosen a, a difficult path because I was looking at someone who was clearly way more talented than I was and 
had I was already uh, miles ahead of me in in like trajectory in, in a ratty apartment. And, and I was like, "Well, this is uh, this. I mean, this is exactly like my house." <laughs> oh yeah, exactly. We're wearing the same kind of clothes and just like you know, yeah, just same shit. Just like, <laughs> but but I learned a couple of other things. First of all, you were so cool to me. You were so cool. Oh, from good. the very first time I approached you and, and asked, you know, would you be interested in... That's good, because I was a jackass pretty often back then, so <laughs> I'm glad I was nice. Right. You, it, it, it was incredible for me, because uh, there were a lot of, like, guys with rock star attitudes, and you never pulled that shit with me. <sighs> Maybe it was because I was bigger than you. <laughs> but um, the other lesson that I learned was that... Uh, I was never going to be as good as you on the bass, but it was that was my gig now. I was going to play the bass. So I, I see, uh, I, I perceive musicianship like, uh, like automobiles, like performance automobiles, right? <laughs> now you can be a Honda and, uh, and that's great. You can be a Toyota Camry. And that, for sure. That's the bass player everybody wants to hire is a Toyota Camry. It can go really fast, but it doesn't have to. <laughs> I think about it in terms of available horsepower. Yeah. And so um, uh, I did not have available horsepower. You you do. You did then. You do t- to this day. And uh, But, <laughs> you, know, but you, you don't always have to hit, put the pedal to the floor, right? But uh, what I realized is I have to give off the air of, pers- uh, I have to make people perceive that I have available horsepower, even if I don't. So every once in a while, I play at the absolute maximum of my ability, but otherwise, do your best to play minimally. Because then it's, then, uh, then the, my abilities seem to be greater by my, um, my bullshit, uh, my put on maturity. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm still chasing the dragon of uh, mature musical choices. It doesn't end. <laughs> but, uh, but I owe all that, or not, maybe not all of it, but I owe a lot of that to you. And now I finally get the chance to say thank you. Well, you're welcome. For teaching me that lesson. Wow, good lord. That's I'm, still, I'm still working on learning it. So, I mean, I mean I've been in Austin forever, and, you know, Red Dirt and the, the whole country end of things is really big down there, and I find myself in it a lot. And it's like, you have to play really simply, but you've got to really stay with the emotion of every note and really stay with the emotion of the person who's singing and the song, you know, so you can't phone it in even though... Oftentimes I have to play really simply, but man, playing a good whole note in a country song is an art, and it's a lot harder than you think it is. <laughs> it's like, I mean, just to go, you know, with perfect time. It's yeah. like ACDC, everyone's like, oh. Dude, like ACDC, it. yeah. Play yeah. it right? Mm. Yeah, be the drummer in ACDC. Yeah. Show and, me and make how it easy it is. feel good? Show me how easy it is. Yeah. Not so much. Exactly. I know, and that's like, that's part of that maturity thing. I mean, I can't, I'm, I used to listen to fusion records when I was a, little, a young kid, and like, I can't even listen to most of that stuff now. Well, it will it'll make me laugh a lot of time because it's almost comical sounding. And some of it sounds, still sounds really good, but it's just funny that, and, you know, that's what I thought you had to be. I thought you had to shred like Jocko or Stanley to even be a viable musician. Right. You know, which is ridiculous. It's stupid. It's a stupid idea. Well, uh, that was one thing because uh, I think the first time I came over, I was like, how do you do that? What are you doing? And you're, I said, I've never even heard music like that. And you're like, well, you know, I'm bitches brew. And I was like, oh, I, don't yeah, even right. know what, I don't even know what that means. What are you talking about? Right. <laughs> so the first thing I did is I went out and bought a, you know, a $30 copy of the record. In the 90s, $30 for a record was only Zappa records Still cost that it? much. I don't. I, you know, this is the, my second record collection. Oh, man, I, right. 
uh, w- when times are lean, uh, I ended up selling my, my records. That's been a proven time. strategy for many musicians. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> indeed, indeed. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, I, I went down the Bitches Brew rabbit hole and uh, Headhunter too. Right, yeah. and that'll branch off into every, like every significant musician of the fusion era. Right. Is coming off that tree for sure. So, was that always what you were into? Well, that in Prague initially. You know what I mean? And, um, You're just and, a and Texas, and, and pop Texas stuff. kid that was like, Texas. I'm going to get into Mahavishnu. Well, there was a lot of us, and then, you know, you'll meet them in Seattle too. There was a generation of us suburban white kids who got really into Prague and fusion. And uh, especially during that time period when I was coming up, there was a whole bunch of us, you know, half of them probably read sci-fi, you know, and it was just like, right. we just wanted things to be fast and futuristic, at least I did, you know, and so I wanted music to be that too. And part of me still wants that, it wants to be surprised and amazed by music, you know, to hear music that's way far above my level, you know, and now classical, a lot of classical will do that to me. And I uh, started the last three years listening to the classical station a lot because that ignored that side of things, just completely ignored it forever, thought it was white and stupid and straight. And uh, and now when I listen to the classical station, I mean, some of the earlier Baroque and classical period stuff can be pretty cornball, but like, man, for the most part, it's just magnificent and amazing. Right. And like, if you're a musician who's stuck in any kind of rut, Listen to the classical station. Man, after a few weeks, like, my bass solos started changing and getting smarter. Like, my ears and my hearing for melody and variation and structure just started getting better. You ever listen Just to from listening to the classical station. <laughs> What's that? You ever listen to Ingve? Well, I mean, he clearly <laughs> spent time with Beethoven, you know, for sure, and all of those guys. I mean, you can just hear it all over his shit. Yeah, yeah. you know. You yeah. can play slow. Well, somebody told me an Ingve story. They were at some Shredder Fest where a bunch of the... It's like a NAM show or something where all the Shredders were there. And then Ingve got him up, got up there and pretty much put them all in the dirt. Right. Like, just really, he was like a level or however many levels deeper, harder, and more boom. He just said every note of his was heavier and more boom. You know, so, I mean, he's the real deal, apparently. For all the jokes, it's like, apparently... He doesn't have a great reputation for being a sweetheart of a man, unfortunately. Oh, yeah, he came in with rock star attitude, I heard, and the whole bit, but and, and a couple of girls and the whole bit, and right. looking kind of rough, but as soon as he started playing, it was like, game on. Right. Which was real cool to hear. It's like, wow, the hype was not bullshit, you know, it was a real deal there. Did, uh... Did you? I know that you were a big Jocko fan. Did you meet Jocko? I did you meet Jocko. Want to hear my Jocko story? It's I, a good one. Yeah. So he played in. Um, say I saw him twice. First time in Dallas was pretty good with a big, bigger band, and then the second time he had that small group with Mike Stern, Kenwood Denard, Melton Mustafa, Alex Foster, Don Elias. I think that was the whole band, and they played at this small. Medium small club in Dallas called Tango. This must have been 83, I think. And me and a couple of buddies went. And it wasn't sold out, but, you know, decent-sized crowd. And, man, they started. And, and before I got there when the, the, the Heads Up was playing, uh, doing an opening slot. And I get there, and this big old dude I knew from junior college goes, Dude, dude, Chaco's upstairs playing Star Wars on the video game. you got to go meet him. And I was like, this was like pretty much as soon as I walked into the place. And so... Uh, um, <laughs> Please tell me you beat him in Star Wars. No, no, he was. But I got upstairs, and he was standing by the railing, with doing this, kind of watching the opening band. And uh, I felt sorry for the bass player, Drew Phelps. That's you on bass. I'll tag you on this. You sounded great on upright, very smart, not playing electric before Jocko. And uh, <laughs> and they sounded great. And Jocko was just very pensively just kind of checking him out. And I went up to him and, and shook his hand. And I said, "Hey, man." I heard you got Mike Stern in the band with you. And he goes, yeah, it's been really good. And then I said, oh, yeah, you still have your front list? And he goes, oh, yeah. And he was being pretty nice. And then he kind of turned toward me and he goes, what time are we playing? Like looking right at me. And I go, I don't know. It's your gig. And then he goes, well, what does it say on your ticket? And I go, doors open at 7. And then he goes, well, do you know what time it is? And I go, I really find out. 
Oh, it's like 9.45, and I think, and he goes, oh, yeah, cool, I guess I better go get ready. And he just, like, took off. It was so fucking weird. He was asking me what time his gig was. He was my hero. I tried to dress like him. I had a fretless the whole bit, you know, sunburst with no pit guard. I mean, we were a bunch of idiots back then. Did he have a bag of cap? Uh, he, no, he just had his hair, and he was real... No, did you? Did you get no, I didn't have the cap yet, but... Uh, and back then, it was before Stern had sobered up, and Jocko was clearly not sober. And, like, interesting, so they played a set, and it was totally burning. I mean, he took all the solos. Was like, <laughs> and I mean, seriously, because I'd seen him, like, a, a year previous, and his solos would be like, just like fragments and it wasn't that happening but this time it was like he had something to prove man I mean he was just he was oh. on fucking fire and uh, he had his acoustic 360 rig the two of them which was very convenient because it sat in the middle of the stage and at least twice during the set okay this is awesome he'd be, <laughs> he'd be playing along puts bass down goes behind bass rig <laughs> okay, Gets he's back. Tuned up. He's, he's back there for a few 10, 20 seconds. As soon as he puts the bass down, Mike Stern turns on his boss octave pedal and starts going on his guitar, walking bass lines, burning as fuck. While Jocko's back there, Jocko comes back out. Cleaning his face. I mean, he'll just pick up mid phrase, man. He'd put the bass down where the fuck ever, and Stern right. would immediately take over. And he did that at least twice, maybe three times during the show. Just hilarious. Just go right behind the amp and then just come right back out. And uh, I'm, sniff, you, uh, I'm sniffing a lot today. I haven't done any blows since 1993. <laughs> but uh, never did have a habit, thank God. But uh, And it was so funny, but he was so. Burning that night, good lord. Were you like, street smart enough to know what he was doing? Oh, we were all cracking up. Yeah, because see, I had a one hitter, and so and me and my a dugout, and me and my buddies were like trading it. I'd go back to the bathroom and take right. a one hit, you know, off my weed, and then give it to another buddy. Might he go in there? We just kind of kept that going the whole show. So I was right. just smoking some decent weed, having a great time, just tripping out on how good they were. I mean, the band was burning. It was amazing. It was a really good night, and. Uh, and they even played Havona at the end of the night, which was just mind blowing. And, uh, and that's my Jocko story. That's a good one. It was awesome, yeah. And that same club later called it was called Tango at the time, and then it ended up being called Redo. And the Bohemians played there one night, probably in '85. We had an opening set, so we finished our set, and I go down the street to the Seven Eleven to get something, and I'm back there in the back of the Seven Eleven, and this big old cowboy comes in. Yeah, man. Well, I went down to Redo, but all they had was this Bohemian butt wipe shit, and I just left. And I'm back there, and I was just, I had the hardest time containing myself. I was laughing so freaking hard. It was the funniest thing. That Bohemian butt wipe shit fucking cracking me up, and I managed to maintain, and he, you know, and I was just laughing, and I went and told the guys, and we were all just like, ah, so fucking hilarious. And, uh... So yeah, that place and it used it was a bank a long time ago. It was on yeah. Green Lab, and now it's a Taco Cabana. But they they tore the building down. But um, yeah, that place. There was a lot of really killer shows that, that were at that place. It was a real real time moment in Dallas music history. Uh, are we allowed? Are we allowed to talk about your bass? Oh yeah, the Reverend. Yeah, this is your girlfriend's bass. This thing is badass. She's this my is wife. A, you, oh, she's your wife. <laughs> oh well, sorry. Excuse me. But uh, she's a very nice lady from Kerrville. That's awesome. So yeah, this is a super badass U USA Music Master Fender that looks to be fairly new. Seventies. Is a really great player. I like this thing. And uh, I've got a signature model coming out with Reverend. You've met Ken Haas. Yeah, nice and, guy. Uh, awesome. Yeah. He and Joe Naylor are just super cool. I and, like what uh, those guys are doing. They are. They're doing it right. They had they had to quit their American production a few years back because their machines kept breaking and they couldn't make any money. And then they switched over to the Korean line that they've got now, and it's amazing. The the, instru the build quality is just stupid. I on played these a couple of those guitars and they're yeah they're great. I want to put my hands on one of those basses. Yeah, we're coming out with the fat the Reverend uh, Bass Hauser Fat Fish Thirty Two. It's a yes. thirty two inch medium scale uh, set medium. neck semi hollow. Um, it's a combination of the Michel and Deggie Ocello bass and the 
Reverend Dub King short scale hollow body and if you melted those two together you would get my base. Amazing. Yeah, it's almost an exact combination. It's not even hardly a new design because it's just so much of a combination of those two instruments. There was, there's one other thing that I learned from you, and that was that you, were, uh, at least in the 90s in Seattle, you were not, you were not particularly precious about uh, instruments. Or well, I, well I, I was. I was just restless. I mean, I would uh, all, you know, always be looking for the, something cool. Uh, I definitely modified my instruments a lot. Ruined a, a nice fender a long time ago. Shaved the neck down. Boy, was that stupid. Um, <laughs> carved a pickup hole in a base with a freaking chisel. That looked like shit. And uh, that was God. It was back when I was young. But um, but you had some like um, you had like a, a three hundred or four hundred dollar Yamaha base. Oh, I had that Yamaha. Yamaha. Yeah, I ended up putting it. And you were like, look at this thing. I threw a new pickup in it, and it's as good as my fill-in-the-blank. And it turned out it wasn't. Because, you, right? you know, the more I played it, the more I realized the limitations of the cheap wood that it was right. made out of. It was a good bass. But that's the thing. Like, a really nice... It's the wood, man. You know as well as yeah, I do. You can put any pickup you want. But, man, if the wood's not happening, forget it. I have a, I have a, a newer telly copy that is relic, and it looks like a 62 telly. And I love the guitar, and it sounds great, it plays great. Um, and uh, a new place called Retro Fret moved in down the street. Um, they, have, and they have a real nice 62 precision in there right now. But I, there was I a, should walk in there just to look. I can't we'll afford to take a walk car. down there. Yeah, we'll go down there. I can't afford to buy none of that. But, <laughs> but they, they had a real 62 tally sitting there, and I picked it up, and it immediately, you know, it was just dry. All those resins had hardened. So light, it weighed about five and a half right. pounds, and it just snapped. Yeah, like you hit a note, and then and it just exploded off the fretboard. It was, I that was when I realized, all oh, right, well, I, I'm you... still allowed to love my copy, but oh sure, this is uh, this is that's why this cost nineteen thousand dollars or whatever. Have you played a Nash yet? It is a Nash. Yeah, Nash, man, it is a Nash. Nash, Nash guitars are awesome. I played a couple of their basses that were just wicked. Jeff Rouse, did you know Jeff Rouse? Jeff Rouse worked at the bass store. Oh, I just recently. I just met him on the phone because I bought a cabinet from Chad at the bass shop in Seattle. Yeah, he plays in Loaded. He's a sweet guy, and he plays. Um, oh, he's your bass player in Loaded because yeah. he was, we and him were talking about that uh, Rollo Rollo yeah. bass head that he uses. Yeah. yeah, that's funny. Oh, wow, cool, right on. <laughs> <laughs> he plays Nashes, and they're. And Bill's a, Bill's a good dude. You'd like Bill. Yeah, Nash guitars. Yeah, they're great. I mean, I'm a reverend dude, but I, in any good instance, Nash is cool. What he's doing is really cool. He's an indie guy. Yeah. You know, he's buying parts, but he seems to have he seems to have that gift for making the right neck and putting the right body and the right neck together. Because it ends up being way more than this, just a parts guitar. You know, you pick up a Nash versus any other parts guitar, and the Nash is going to kill it. And, uh, I've built a parts guitar before. It's it's not like my it's Nash. not like Nash. No, yeah, it's not. He's he's got the magic. Apparently, Roger Sadowski has a similar magic where he's got that ability to really this neck's going to be good with this body. Boom, you know. Uh, let's see what else. So when is that? Do you know? Uh, uh, January Nam. Oh really? Coming up. Oh killer! I'm gonna try to come to Nam this year. I, I'm probably. probably going myself. I don't have a place to stay hooked up yet, but I got a badge from Reverend, so um, I'm gonna try to be out there for that. I know that it's gonna be a high high traffic time, so I'm gonna try and go out there and do some mobile couch reps. Cause see that case right there? My whole rig fits in there. Oh yeah, right. So Ooh. I can do everything I need to do fits in that pedal board case. Boom. Fancy. Well, Ken, Ken's convinced that me and Reeves Gabriels need to play together. He said, yeah, you guys would just be like, and so that's cool. So Ken, Have you seen him play? Not live. And I've seen him footage, and I know of him pretty well. And he's like, just one of these crazy postmodern freakazoid monsters. And like, uh, Ken's hosting a, a jam night. Uh, during Nam somewhere around there, and so he's want we, there. We'll see what happens on that. Oh, that's great. We uh, Christine and I saw the Cure at the Garden. Oh, he's in the Cure. That's oh, right. dude, he's in the Cure. Like he gets all the best gigs, doesn't he? 
But yeah, Tim Machine, The Cure. Yeah, Reeves is doing all right. That's right, I forgot he's in The Cure. That's so cool. Not a bad gig. You know, I didn't like The Cure a long time ago. Until you listened pay... to the bass? Well, until I just didn't pay any attention to it back in the day. And now, in recent years, I hear them and I, it sounds cool, you know. Um, I don't know the bass player's name, but some of the best... Simon Gallup, I believe. Yes. Yeah. Some of the best bass tones in rock music. I mean, that too... for five minutes. I play that in a cover band, the Mott's down in Austin. They're awesome. Uh, we play that song and it's just like, God, it's exhilarating to play that tune. It's and got it, a thing, you and know? And there's only one, it's kind of like the uh, the original Seven Nation Army. It's just that part and one other part. Right, I know. Yeah, it's a very simple song. And, uh, you know that Bauhaus, I don't know, what was it? Like, do, 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 Yeah, Joy Division, right. That song, that's all it does. Like everybody's playing that, the vocals playing that, the bass is playing that, the synth, they're all playing that line in unison and that's all the song does. Is that right? I, I heard it a few, uh, few weeks ago and I was like really listening to it and went, wait, everything's in unison, they all just play that melody. Sets playing it, bass is playing it, vocals are singing it. I was like, wow, how weird is that? So bizarre. And I never even noticed before until I like actually listened to it hard. Turns out it did okay for him. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I know. It's just like, it, it obviously didn't have to be complicated all the time. You know, it didn't have to sound like Jocko wrote it, you know, to be music. I wish someone would have told me that. I wish somebody time. told me that too. Good Lord, I have a lot. There's probably four or five simple riff songs that I just threw away that turned out to be really good that I'm just like, that's ah, not cool enough or it's not something enough or, or you know. Right. <laughs> uh, let me check and make sure this camera is still recording because it'll only do. <clears throat> uh, we've been going for a while, so. It'll only do 20. Yeah, it stopped. Okay, fine. It'll only 